during breakfast at Tiffany's last year, which, oh my God, we're coming up on a year. was the last show. It's the last show. I know. And I remember you talking about getting into directing and how excited you were for the upcoming season. Obviously it's turning out a little bit different, but how excited are you to be directing another show to be, and to be directing this show overtones? Well, truthfully, I had zero plans to do anything like this because, you know, we were just uh, planning to, life was going to go back to normal and direct a play the normal way that you would. And then this opportunity came about where it was basically like, find something that there's no rights, that has a small cast that you can do without a lot of rehearsals. I mean, it was, it was basically an offer to not do it, right? It was like, don't do it. But because I'm a New Yorker and I'm a tough um, New York broad, I was like, well, I'll still find a way to do it. And so like at midnight, I couldn't fall asleep and I Googled female playwrights, you know, public domain work. And I happened to find something I fell in love with. You know, for me, I, I can't do something if I'm not in love with it. And this piece just spoke to me because it was about the female condition a hundred years ago, literally it was written a hundred years ago and it's completely relevant today. And that I thought was worth doing, even in a pandemic, even with masks on, masks on, even on camera, <laughs> you know, because there's a lot, we had to jump over a lot of uh, barriers to do it, but putting together the team of women to do this project has been probably the most satisfying part. And it's, I love all the fact that you're like, okay, uh, here are all the parameters for the play that we can do. And it, it can be a little bit discouraging because like you said, if you're going to direct something, you really want to be able to connect with it and feel it. Otherwise, how can you possibly bring it to life in the way that you want to, and then get your cast to bring it to life in the way that you want to. So to hit all those parameters, be like, okay, great. Like that knocks off so many of these plays, but you did, you found one that even when I was just reading about it, I'm like, I am so intrigued by this because like you said, it's so relevant today and not even just for women. I think that the themes of identity and what our role is supposed to be versus what we might want to be, that is so relatable to everybody. When you saw this play and you're like, okay, this is the one that I want to do. What was the most exciting part about bringing it to life? What got you the most amped about taking it on? I think the most exciting was modernizing it. So one a director that's a mentor of mine, who's another Heights player director had said to me, you know, just Google it and look up clips on YouTube of how other people do it and it'll give you ideas. And I took that advice because I admire this person. And I looked at a few snippets of other people's and I was like, this, nope, this isn't for me. This isn't gonna help me because they were all like women in ball gowns doing it as if it was 1913. and it didn't resonate with me. And so that was a helpful piece of advice, even though I didn't actually follow it to a T because I was like, it made me realize, oh, there's another way to do this that I actually have a hook into, which is how do we modernize this? So it's sort of like, you know, the Romeo and Juliet of our youth with Leonardo DiCaprio. Like, that's what it made me think of. Like, how do we modernize this Shakespeare, quote unquote, for a modern age and take these women and bring them into 2020 because, or 2021 in this case, uh, we're wearing masks, it's a pandemic, and there's a twist to it that is unspoken, which is now we all wear a mask, which is our social media profile. Who you pretend to be on social media is may maybe not exactly who you are, right? There's like the Instagram version of you. Yes. And then there's you. And we only put the pictures on, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I only put the pictures. <laughs> on Facebook and Instagram that are flattering. And you have the opportunity to untag when it's not flattering. And there's this like inner person within us that is we don't show to the world. And that's what this play is about. And there was no Instagram in 1913, just so for the kids under 25, that wasn't a thing back then. But there was, still, <laughs> there was still this tension between what you said earlier, who do I have to be in the world and who am I really? And especially for women, because a lot of uh, catching a husband, if you will, and then keeping a husband was about putting on a certain facade in order to look like good marriage material. So tell us, about, and I love that you're, you're taking it and going, you know what, let's do something different and modernize it. So tell us about, for someone who's like, okay, what is Overtones? What is Overtones about? Because the plot in itself is very much rooted in the society that was 1915. And how are you taking that? And what are you changing up to make it modernized? Because even the approach to marriage obviously has changed. So 
What is Overtones about and what are you changing about it to bring it up to 2021? Overtones is about an encounter between two women who used to know each other when they were in their youth and they were both in love with the same man. And one of them got to marry this man and one didn't. And they've met again after many years. And now this man, John, is a famous artist in Europe. And the woman who didn't get to marry him is wondering if she made the right decision. And she's lamenting, you know, I, I made a choice to marry for money, not for love. And she got him and I didn't. And now I have the money and she has the love. And did I make the right choice? And so they're getting together to have tea because they both want something from each other which is rooted in this man that we never see. You know, the play is only for women. And I loved that idea as well because so many things in life happen because of the deals made in a, in a tea room because of a couple of women. <laughs> Not the men necessarily that are involved. You know, behind every great man is an is a even better woman or whatever the expression is. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's what, this, that's what this play is about, literally is this encounter between these two women. Now, when these two women have their encounter, their inner selves are also with them and they are actually personified and played by other women. And so in our production, they are played by two younger women and we've decided that they are, you know, they're sort of eternal youth personified. So they're inner selves that have not aged and that are the raw nerve of themselves that does not have to put on a facade to live in polite society because they don't live in polite society. They live within the four walls of this woman's psyche. And so there's four women on stage, but only two are in polite society and two are just the ranting and ravings of what these women are really feeling. And it also speaks to, unfortunately, I think a lot of times, you know, have, uh, what women say to each other, oh you, oh, you could just wear anything. You just look so lovely. Oh, I love your dress. And inside you're mm -hmm. saying, oh my God, she looks terrible. And we don't want to admit ever that we're those women. I'd like to think I'm not one of those women, but we've all been victim of it. And that I think is also, you know, how many times have I seen something on social media and then said to my girlfriend, did you see what so-and-so put on Facebook? And we have a side conversation about it. Meanwhile, it's like, you look great. <laughs> you know what we're <laughs> typing. So the, what we did to modernize it, one is that we did not do um, the period costume that they're in these ball gowns and they're li they were literally wearing veils in previous productions to show that they're like the shadow of the woman. But because we're already wearing masks, it seemed like a little overkill to then also wear a veil. I'd like right. to see the actress's faces. <laughs> so we didn't do that. Um, they're in modern dress. Uh, we modernized the set and the props. And we talked about it mostly from the characterizations being a modern lens. I love it. I am so, I love the idea of taking it and like you said, the Romeo and Juliet of Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes kind of just forcing it from the lens of today, because I think sometimes it's easier to, to disconnect yourself from, if it's as a period piece, oh, things aren't like that anymore. We can almost say like, oh, we, you know, things have gotten better or they're not the same. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's also sometimes helpful to be like, no, 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 no. That's just the dressing, the situation, right. the themes, the meat of this. The period is just the dressing. That's just the details. But you take that chunk underneath, that's still happening now. And I think it's a lot harder to disconnect from it when it's placed in the world you're living in today, which is the modernization of this. And I love the fact that these two ladies are on stage. With, that's the part that I think to me intrigued me the most when I first read about this was that these alter egos are on stage talking with them because was so, we all have that inner voice. We all have had to play that role where we're nice <laughs> to people that we don't necessarily want to be nice to. And whether it's because we are being purposely fake or just it's like what's the headache of starting drama with somebody whatever the reason is we've all played that role and we've all had like that key and peel sketch with obama's anger and like <laughs> anger oh, translator <yes. laughs> yeah. where we all have that inner monologue where if we didn't have any rules or barriers and we all just said what was on our minds all the time just brutally honest and, and went off of feelings what would be said and how interesting that would be and how different of a life we might have so that I love the fact that they're on stage with them and they're constantly there as this like yin and yang situation how long is the play about like I think it's just one act right so how long does this one act run and when can we expect this at the Heights Players when can we excited when can we be excited to see this the length of the show is the perfect length it's 25 minutes so order your dinner 
get it in and then be ready to watch starting March 19th. It'll be streaming from our website at theheightsplayers.org. 25 minutes of action packed, fantastic acting some from four fabulous actresses. I cannot wait. And let's talk about those actresses because with four women on stage and even there have to there has to be some synergy between let's say the character and that character's alter ego that's playing on stage. Talk to me about casting the show and what was it about each actress that you're like, that's it. I know you're perfect for this. Well, I was not really able to do auditions. So I did pick from actresses that I had worked with before. And one of them I had actually never met. I had worked with her through a virtual play that I directed via Zoom, but we never met in person actually. Oh so that was kind of interesting, um, despite the fact that I directed her in a play. So I reached out to them all. I sent them a copy of the script. I told them, I'm casting this play. There's four amazing parts for women. I have no idea which part you're going to play because I didn't know how I would pair them up. Um, two, two women are, you know, younger in their twenties and two women are, you know, veteran actresses of the stage and they're in a different age bracket. So I, I just thought there's many different ways I could cast this. Um, so I, I invited them to come and just sort of play with me and let's see what we do. And we, we had a few rehearsals where they just read all the different parts and I heard them and I watched them and I saw them. And then we put it together where they're, they got the parts that they ended up with. And then when we met in person and this one particular actress, Liz Matera showed up and I met her for the first time, she was so different in person than I anticipated. Um, beautiful, I knew she was beautiful, but tall and beautiful long legs. And I just was so shocked because I had never had this experience of having directed someone in a play for months. And I thought I knew her and then she showed up and I was like, oh my God, you're stunning. And you're just not what I was expecting, not in a good or bad way, but just, um, just that we're living through this age where people aren't what they seem because we're, we're experiencing them through a lens, through a Zoom camera or whatever it mm -hmm. may be. And it does distort. And again, it's not a judgment. It's just a distortion that is inorganic. And I, I look forward to the days when we can be back in the theater and there's none of that filtering mm -hmm. done except for your own eyeballs. But I think what we've been able to capture because these actresses are all very experienced stage actresses is that you're going to see some amazing acting and the camera is just going to be there like a fly on the wall to catch to catch it and capture it and it'll feel like being in a in a stage production and not but, watching a filmed production if that makes sense i mean that's my goal yes. anyway it's going to the fact that it's also just these four characters on stage, I think also helps with the intimacy of it, feeling like you are watching them on stage because there isn't there isn't as much going on with as many characters to jump back and forth between. So you can really kind of stay focused as if you were just watching them on stage. The two characters in the show, which are, are well, Hetty and Maggie are the two main characters in the show. What about them? What do you think is similar about them? And what do you think that they were both looking for in this show that they ended up falling in love with the same guy. One of them got to marry them. One of them didn't there. There's gotta be some tension there, but what do you think these two women living at that time were searching for within the relationship within themselves and from the world at large? I think that women are fed oftentimes this narrative of you can't have it all. And I think maybe our mothers or a generation a generation just ab before you and I was told, well, you can have it all. And now maybe my generation is realizing, oh wait, actually you can't have it all. And so you come to a point in life where you've made a decision and you've gone down a path where you've married a certain person and bought a certain home and lived in a certain city or whatever the case may be, chosen a certain career and turning a milestone birthday or maybe somebody dying close to you makes you sit and reflect and say, did I take the right path? And did I ha get to have it all? Or did I choose at least the right things to choose as my all because you can't have everything. And these women chose a path and they chose two different paths. One chose love and one chose money. And they both ended up with a part of the puzzle that they wanted, but not the whole thing. And I think that if we're lucky enough to get to that stage of life where we have it all, then we've done something, uh, we've been incredibly lucky or we've done something incredibly right. But I think most of us will say, well, I should have done, or what would it have been like if I had married somebody else or I'd taken that other job or if I had you know, moved to Europe when I you know, said I was going to, whatever the case may be. So they, they come together because they've had a happenstance meeting after many years of not having seen each other and curiosity kills 
them. One's curious what the other has in terms of love and the other's curious what the other has in terms of money. And I think by the end of it, they each have made peace to a certain extent with what they have and what they don't have. And they go, they just decide by the end of the play to go down new paths to try and get it all. Because that is like, that's the purpose of the struggle of life is to and keep trying to have it all. And that's something that I, that we definitely relate to. Don't, doesn't matter what time period you're looking at is that idea of constantly wondering, did I make the right choices? And always wondering about things that you wish had worked out differently or that you wish were in your life that you somehow either can't attain or, or know that you won't ever, what it feels like to be in somebody else's shoes. I mean, there's, I think humans are naturally curious. And so we can't necessarily have it all. I think it is impossible to have all of all the things. Like it's just not, but we want to know what that's like because we are naturally curious. And so I think you're right. It, it just never, it never fully ends in constantly trying to find that path and, and get as close as possible to what you think you want your life to be and how you want it to end up. But there's always going to be questions about it. Um, and getting into a little bit more on the personal side for you and as a director, why directing and and what is it about taking a story and bringing it to life that spark something in you why do you love being a director and also has your directing your approach to it had to change at all because obviously you're doing this a lot differently than you would if we were doing a normal theater production you know as a female in this industry in order to have a voice and in order to have an impact I felt that I needed to go down the path of directing because as an actress you audition and you hope to get a part and, um, you know, there's a lot of actresses just like me out there in the world. And so if I wanted to have control and power and be able to tell the stories that are important to me, I had to take on directing. And so it became basically a necessity if I wanted to have a voice. And The Heights Players is literally a stone's throw from Manhattan and from Times Square and Broadway, where there's constantly a conversation about, is there enough diversity? Are there enough female directors? Are there enough um, you know, playwrights that are people of color, et cetera, et cetera. And we're literally the pipeline for all of that because we are theater for the community right over the bridge in Brooklyn Heights. And I wanted to be a part of a female voice coming up through our theater for the community who could also bring up more female voices and people of color um, so that there's more opportunity for everybody. So I, you know, I have always directed ever since college, bas basically because I didn't want to be able to not be able to do shows because I didn't get cast, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. But if you want to be a storyteller, you have to, you have to get into the craft of being on the other side of it, directing, etc. because auditioning, you don't always get to tell the story that you want to tell. So that's why I went into directing. Your second part of the question was what now? Remind me. Oh, for the approach oh, how to, I have obviously, to change it? yeah, if there was any change Sorry. to the way that you direct based on obviously the, the pandemic world that we're living in. <laughs> right. So <laughs> directing in the world of social distancing is difficult because you can't touch people. Like literally, you can't put the mm -hmm. actors too close together and have them touch each other. And also you can't see faces. So it is really challenging to adapt to that. And what we did on this piece is that we did a lot of rehearsals over Zoom in advance where we did all the character work together um, so that we were socially distanced and safe. And then I basically took all the layers that I would have done sequentially and I did them all at once. So I told the, the actors, it was like, we, we just baked a lasagna of all the layers at once, rather than lay out all the ingredients and then do it at the end, we had to do it, you know, um, all at the same time, because we could not literally be around each other too much because it's not safe. And that's why I cast these women who are amazing actresses, because I knew they were up for the challenge. It was not a project where I'd say, oh, let's take a chance on a newcomer because we had to do this at the speed of light. We've only had a handful of rehearsals and I think the results will speak for it. It was not a project where I'd say, oh, let's take a chance on a newcomer because we had to do this at the speed of light. We've only had a handful of rehearsals and I think the results will speak for themselves that these women just really just took the ball and, and ran with it um, even with only a few rehearsals. So I think that was one way I cut the learning curve. What 
what we're going to do also to manage the fact that we can't be super close to each other is that we're going to use the camera to help build tension because we can't build it physically. And my director of photography, who's also my editor, is a young woman named Brie Bracey. She is a, a you know, an ex-film student, you know, she's finished her film degree. She's very passionate about theater and directing. And I, I saw something in her years ago, we just never got an opportunity to work together. And I really wanted a, another collaborator on this project who was a female and who was looking for an opportunity to grow in some way with this production, not just to check another box on the res. Oh yeah, I did overtones. Yeah, I did that play. To actually have some sort of, um, you know, an expansive opportunity. And so she's filming it and editing it which is a big opportunity for her to do both. And she's been a part of the rehearsal process the whole way through. So that's the other way we're managing the social distancing is that she knows exactly what we rehearsed so that she can film it to a T and we can create that heightened drama that way, though we can't see their mouths or get them too close to each other. Although I will say we do have a really cool fight sequence um, with even the masks and the social distancing, that is really, really well done. And kudos to the actors for pulling that off. So I won't tell you who or when, but there is a little bit of cool COVID fighting. Co awesome. COVID safe fight choreography. <laughs> I love that. We that's got creative. Great. You And that's the thing you have to, in a, in a way, I, this this situation that you know doing trying to do things through whether it's a play through zoom completely or like this where you have a small handful of people in the theater and the audience gets to get to view it virtually you're forced to reimagine what you see as theater and what you see as art and how it can be done and that's not necessarily a bad thing because it whenever you open yourself up to more possibilities even if some of the ones that you try don't work you've already expanded the way that you think about things. And that means you've opened up new viewpoints that might bring in other people or, or just a different way to, to, to bring something to people that makes them view the story in a different way. That's like, oh, I wouldn't have taken it in that way. Or I wouldn't have noticed this if I didn't watch it this way. You know, it's, it, we definitely all miss theater, theater, like being in the theater with people totally. and, and living that experience together. But the fact that we can do this and still share something together is incredibly important and incredibly wonderful. And I think that we're really lucky that we're living in a time that we can do that. Um, it's been so nice catching up with you. I have one more, before I let you go, just one more quick wrap up. Let's, if you, someone was like, all right, Marie, why should I come see Overtones? What, when can I see it? How can I see it? And why should I see it? You can see it starting March 19th. It's going to be running on our website and it'll be on demand. So watch it at 2 a.m. in your pajamas, if you like, if that works for you. That's how do you come see it is you go to heightsplayers.org and you can buy tickets right from there and get them emailed to you. I mean, it's never been more convenient to get to the theater. So no excuses. Um, and why? Uncover something about the human condition about what it is to be a human breathing, emotional person on this, on this earth who questions if they did the right thing with their life and sometimes listens to that little voice in their head that says, that's a lie, or you know, you're know, you fake, or how awful, you look good today, or no, you don't. And, and, and just be a part of the human condition with us and let's, let's experience that together. That's, that's what I think is beautiful about theater in general. You don't have to come see my show to experience that, but this is the one we're offering. So overtones, listen, if you want to see some amazing acting by fantastic actresses, then that's why you should come too, because they are acting their masks off practically. Um, I'll keep it G rated. They're F acting their masks off practically, but safely. And uh, it's really, really well done. And it's an all female, really, it's, it's almost an entirely female led production female director, female editor, female cast. So if you're into that girl power, come and see our show. I love men are yay! welcome to, the men are welcome to. It's all good. The more the <laughs> merrier. So, so you, know, you share the planet with half the other sex. So it's always good to uh, see what they're up to. Theater doesn't care what you consider yourself. The art and the human condition is open for everybody. We're, we're all human beings with emotions. That is for <laughs> sure.
Exactly. 